Welcome to the Med Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Hey, podcast listeners, it's 2020, dawn of a new decade. Man, that's hard to say. Today, we've got a great show for you. Our guest is a partner at venture capital firm 10110 and is also co-host of the Great LA Venture Podcast. She is a longtime Silicon Valley product leader and operations exec. She started her career as an early product manager at Google, where she co-founded the Access Team, a cross-functional product policy and engineering team that spun off Google Fiber. After 11 years at Google, she left to begin her own entrepreneurial journey as the co-founder and CEO of Shift, an online marketplace for used cars. In today's episode, we discuss 10110 and venture capital investing. We touch on the firm's focus on software and data and the growing VC presence in La La Land. We cover some of the criteria they emphasize when making investments, and we even get into some companies the firm is excited about, including one that leverages AI to assist doctors. Please enjoy this episode with Minnie Ingersoll. Welcome, Minnie Ingersoll. Thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. Live and in person, an LA local, LA native? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, I'm originally a Colorado, North Carolina guy, but I see you also did a stop for a while in the Bay Area before transplanting down here. Yeah. When, when was the, the move? Uh, after high school. No, no, no. Back, back to back. LA. Oh, a year ago. Okay. Now. Okay. So relatively recent. It seems to be kind of a one-way street recently. A lot of San Fran. I feel like there used to be a little bit of a San Fran LA rivalry many years ago. Not so much anymore, but it seems to be a lot of immigration coming in. Uh, we'll get to all this, but you've had a lot of stops along the way. We'll get to that. But fellow podcast host, how's it going? Listening to a lot of the episodes. You guys are doing a good job. I love podcasting. It's great. It's a good way for me to learn too. Your day job as a venture capitalist. Tell me a little bit about y'all shop. What are you guys doing? Yeah, sure. So I am at 10110. We are based here in LA and we're early stage, sort of seed stage investors into mostly sort of the nerdier side of companies. So software and data is our focus. And we, you know, it's it's a great position to be in. We're often giving someone their first couple million dollars. So someone who's been, you know, raising money from friends and family for a year, getting, you know, a product just in market, but really needs a million or two to build it to the next level. And we get to be that first institutional money. So traditionally, that would be what people would call Series A sort of? We're pre-Series A. Pre-Series I mean, A. Because it's, it's funny because I've been, I've been investing on in privates for about five years and I wish almost there was a common definition <laughs> because right. what would used to be seed, now there's pre-seed and extensions and series A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Anyway, so you guys are kind of pre-series A. You know, it's it's really, someone's raising a million and a half or $2 million should just be what we talk about is how much money are they raising? And that should get them to the next step where they're going to raise $8 million. So so y'all are you taking down the whole chunk? Are you a part of a group? How does it usually work? Yeah, either way. So, you know, one of the things I care about is listening to the market and listening to entrepreneurs and what do they need. And a lot of entrepreneurs we talk to need someone to lead their rounds. So we like to lead rounds, but we don't have to lead rounds. So that might be that we are writing a 750K check into a million and a half round. So even, and, and that could be a lead for us, but we're not taking that whole round. So it's a pulling together the rest of the round with the entrepreneur um, and making it so they're in a good position to get to the next stage. Okay. So you say you guys focus a little bit on data and tech. It's funny because I smile because I remember when some of the crowdfunding startup portals going back many years, I mean, Angela, Angela says they only do tech. And then I see literally the stuff that comes across my desk. It's like, bra companies, you know, soap companies. <laughs> like it's like you could probably say anything is tech at this point. Tell me a little bit more about what you guys are actually, you know, looking for or or investing in. Yeah, no, it's it's super interesting. I was just so on my podcast, I was just interviewing someone. I said, what are you really investing? He said, I want to invest in a company that I think I could run. 
which is an interesting. So if you were a bra company, I don't think I could run that. I don't really know how to launch a direct to consumer brand. It's not my strength. So we tend to invest in companies that resemble companies that we have built before. So my fund, we're all founders of companies that have been in software and data. So we like to fund things that we feel like we understand, not that I could run, not that I want to run, but that I can be some value add to that entrepreneur. So my background's in computer science. I've been a product manager for many years. I like to get involved where there's a real piece of like product market fit to figure out. That's kind of a nice place to be in. I mean, for me, the like the the really early stage seed stuff where it's just like a dream and an idea seems so hard. You know, once once you start to see a little bit of a product and traction. All right, talk to me. How do you guys go about sourcing and finding these deals? Is it people just um, listening to the Meb Faber show, going to send you an email and that's that. Do you guys do it through traditional VCs where it's just your network? How how do you go about finding these? Yeah, no, I think it's the former. I really think that everyone who listens to your show should just send me great companies. All That'd right, be perfect. deal. We'll put um, your contact info on there. Yep, yeah, great. No, please do. I mean, there is a lot of, it is a deluge of companies constantly. I've actually gotten really good. You can throw my email up there, no problem, because it's just, a, a, it is a constant deluge of things. You know, the first screen is just, is this approximately right? Which is, I get a ton of people who are raising $10 million for a direct-to-consumer bra company, which is like pretty clearly not what we do. So, I mean, a lot of it is our backgrounds and sort of, People know us and know us for certain things. And so my partner, Gil Elbaz, he started a company, Applied Semantics, that built AdSense. And then he ran Google's LA office for many years. So many of the product managers, engineers who used to work for Gil, let's say, they then think, I'm going to start a company. They think, who do I know in VC? They think, I remember that Gil is a VC at 10110. So that's kind of a common thing, but that sort of implies that someone knows us and was an engineer at Google. And certainly we get tons of interesting companies that we fund that are actually much further afield and we like that. So one of the things we like is actually big industries that are ripe for disruption because they haven't had tech before. And so I'm looking at a trucking company out of Nebraska right now, or it's not really a trucking company, but it's tech for a trucking company. And so those come to us in different manners. That one I actually met, I guess, sort of through an accelerator. My grandfather on my dad's side was actually a truck driver out of Nebraska. My old man grew up on a on a farm when they moved into town was like 100 people. So if you ever come across Holstein, Nebraska, it's a tiny town that most people in Nebraska have never even heard of outside of Hastings. So if you're doing due diligence, you see a sign for it. You'll know that's, that's where uh, part of my family comes from. So, okay. Where do you guys stand in the whole allocation process? Because I know, so you guys have been around the VC shop, been around for like five, six years. You, you joined about a year ago. You all have invested in 30, 40 companies? A little bit more than that. But, but yes, order of magnitude, totally right. Which is, so we had a fund one that was started in 2013 vintage, 2013, 14. And then we raised a fund two. And I was in the lucky position, which is a nice position to be in, which is I got to come in when Fund 2 was just being deployed. And so we're now about 50% deployed from Fund 2, and we're going to kick off fundraising for Fund 3 soon. Did you guys get upset, or was this a, did you just kind of smile? Because didn't Travis... Oh, yeah. Come up with a name oh, yeah. that's that's pretty close to y'all's name. What's yeah. the name of his new fr- uh, fund? I think it's 10 to 100 or something. <laughs> okay. And we're 10, 110. Uh, totally fair. I was laughing because I was like, wait, I don't think that's the same company. No, we're okay. totally like very different from Travis, I think, in many different ways. In many ways. Okay. Let's stay on kind of themes on what you guys are looking for, industries. Maybe get a little more specific as you can. You mentioned trucking. How do you sort of funnel down what comes across your desk as data and tech is such a wide funnel or filter. Are there any areas that you think in particular are y'all's focus? Or is it something that you're just pretty open to just about anything? It depends which axis to go on to some degree. So one axis is like, I know that one of my partners, if there's an interesting proprietary data set involved, something that's built up over time, let's say, or 
or aggregated from multiple sources. He gets excited. This is Gil. He spent a lot of time with data sets and proprietary data. And he will get excited about anything like that. So if anything comes across the transom like that, I know to send it to him because I know it's just got a higher likelihood of getting him excited. How does he even come across those? I mean, it's funny because, you know, we're a public investor and my pin tweet for the longest time, because I get this question every single day, was people would email me and say, Meb, where do I go to find global valuation historical for stock markets around the world? And there's about a dozen sources. Listeners will add it to the show notes. But every single day, someone would ask me. And, and so there's all sorts of different sources, different looking you know, cousins of each other. But people are certainly always on the lookout for unique. And, and to me, that's not even a unique one. That's one that just you got to kind of dig for. How rare is it these days? How hard is it? And then how often is it that it's not public that it's totally proprietary like i like it's it seems like it'd be um that's kind of the the gold at the end of the rainbow almost how public is it like that gill is the person to reach out to well just like how does he even find these like the people just like say okay gill's the man i got well i think they're okay so there's kind of two different sorts of vcs i think like i think people are sort of more inbound or more outbound right and there are some shops that have a particular thesis and they think that, you know, the agriculture business is ripe for disruption and therefore they're going to figure out who's solving that problem. And then there's, I think, a majority of VCs who are much more open to entrepreneurs coming to us and telling us, I've spent 18 years in the trucking business. There's an opportunity here and help educate us about the opportunity. We're much more of that latter sort, which is someone comes to us. But, you know, one thing that would be common, and and I did this when I was running my company, which is... I was running an online marketplace. And so I wanted to know who has thought about online marketplaces, which investors have done a lot of investing in online marketplaces. This is 2013. So it wasn't quite, the VC wasn't quite as exploded as it is now. But so someone might say, who has invested in satellite data companies? Or, you know, who has invested in location data companies? And so then they'll look at, you know, Descartes Labs is, one of, is in our portfolio and they have satellite data for agriculture. So then you're building something sort of similar. You've got drones and you're using drones to predict traffic patterns. Well, you can kind of see, oh, an investor who liked Descartes might also like my my drones for traffic patterns. The, uh, you know, it's funny. So building off what I was talking about earlier with my dad's side is we come from a farming family. And so we still do. We actually just had Milo Harvest recently, but manage um, some farmland in Western Kansas, which is really an incredible asset class. It's almost impossible to allocate to, it's almost like 95% private and not private being institutions, but sort of individuals and families. But despite that being one of the largest asset classes in the world that um, is kind of uncorrelated in it anyway. But it's funny because it's still very, I mean, it's it's getting a lot more tech focused, the tractors, you know, and everything. But still, I look at it and I'll go out to Kansas and say, how are people even involved in this at all? It's like all rows. It's all just like a huge grid. Like you can see in probably five, 10 years, this is just going to be like almost completely automated, right? Anyway, so it's a... it's an area that I'm I'm sure ag tech there's a there's a ton of disruption going on, but but also with prices so low, uh, it's not it hasn't been a great uh, investment for the past three or four years, five years. Yeah, and and I don't know about exactly as an investment in the agriculture as an asset class, but you can easily imagine that increasing crop yields by fifteen percent can have a huge impact. And and I'm a believer in sort of space is the next frontier, um, like, but not like space travel, although that's interesting as well, but more like using drones, using satellites, all of what we can do with that information can really affect what the decisions traditional industries are making. Well, sure. Like, I mean, even just like the the plot of a quarter of land, there's like some hot spots that a satellite or you could see from above that historically you just say, well, we're just not going to get as much yield there. Anyway, yep. So talk to us a little bit about, um, maybe feel free to use any examples. The past year, you canniballed into the pool, full into VC. Any particular companies you guys have invested in over the past year? Anything that you're particularly excited about? Sure. I mean, I can tell you about a couple that I've sort of led the investment on because those are always exciting. So I did one recently. I hope I'm going to do it justice. Uh, It's called Stratic. And this is building... It's a, it's static pages for your for your WordPress website. So 
over a third of the internet is hosted on WordPress and growing. So everyone is using WordPress, but it's bloated. It's got all these plugins. It's increasingly insecure, so open to hacking and slow. And I'm not talking about just your personal blog. I mean, you know, USA Today, Google uses WordPress. Um, so there's this other trend, which is to have static pages. So For the just, listeners, what does that mean? Just a, a page of text, essentially. And so that can load really quickly. You can't hack a static page that just hosted on a, a content delivery network. So, so she's got this great. She's she and her uh, two co-founders. They're building this tool that allows you to convert your WordPress site into a static page, but still use the WordPress front end. So that if you've got a large marketing department, you don't have to give up what you know. Whereas now we have the ten one ten web page is a static page. But you have to have a developer or someone who can program in order to make those changes. So she's kind of got the best of both things there. But then her CTO is the person who invented PHP, which is the programming language that WordPress is written in. And so he spent his whole career working on making the web faster. So I think it, it sounds sort of like a small thing to be able to, to sort of compile your WordPress site. But it's actually an interesting uh, technical challenge. And I think they're the perfect team so what I'm looking for is not just do I believe in the trends, but also do I believe that this is the right team to solve that problem? And, and how do you determine that? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a quant, right? So a lot of this stuff for me is a little squishy and I find it harder, often more obvious in retrospect. But what, what are you looking for when you say the right team? Like, is it that they have a background? They're just passionate? What? Yeah, well, I, I mean, my previous lessons of, of what I have done the past like couple decades is just scale companies. And when you're scaling companies, what you're doing is just interviewing people all day. So I, I think my title, I know my title was COO at both my previous roles, but actually I was just HR, just recruiting. And so I think it's a similar sort of challenge to hiring people. Like there isn't enough traction at the stage that I'm investing in. It's not really a spreadsheet thing. It is really the people need to be able to sell me on their vision, like explain the trends to me, the macro trends that are coming together. So they need to sell me, but they're going to need to sell future rounds of funding. They're going to need to sell all their future hires because I want this team to go from seven people to 200 people. So they need to be able to bring on people and they're going to need to sell customers. So that ability to explain the vision, which the CEO, Miriam, is fantastic at selling that vision, is one of the big things I'm looking for. S sticking on this company for a second, how does this monetize? Is it something that they sell like a it's just like a SaaS model or they're selling to the end user or is it only enterprise how like how does it end up working some of it's early enough that some of the thing that we will be working on together is just what what are the best channels and so they have lots of customers who are on their wait list and eager for this but making sure those are the right customers right and so generally this is replacing your hosting provider so people are used to paying for their website to be hosted, and this would replace that subscription. So you could say just price it exactly the same and go through similar channels, or there are different creative things you can do. She could be selling into agencies who maintain and produce these websites on behalf of, but thinking through those different channels and testing those and deciding which to test and how much resource to put behind them is still some of the art. It's interesting. We got a WordPress blog. We, uh, I, I, a couple of my favorites, um, we got a couple of buddies who still have, listeners will know these guys, but Jake at Economic and Anzwath Damadaran, NYU professor, both still have the old school like blog spot, mm. you know, but but it's like the original theme from, I don't, 2006 or whatever it is, and they refuse to change it. It's such a great relic. We're on version, I don't know, 10.0. I still ours. have my blog spot. I keep all my t-shirt. I mean, I don't keep all of them. My, uh, but uh, I remember because I was at Google when we acquired Blogger, and that was so I, I have those T-shirts proudly still in in rotation. <laughs> I could probably find some on eBay somewhere. By the way, eBay's I'm listing a cooler on eBay right now. This is totally unrelated to anything, but it is the god awful worst experience. There's a couple of these legacy old school multi billion dollar companies that are just ripe for. I mean, and I'm sure there is some unrelated. I um, just had to throw that in. Okay, so what other 
companies in the last year? Any others that come to mind that you're particularly excited about or good examples of kind of how y'all think? Yeah, although I could have um, picked up on with uh, on a uh, thing about eBay. But you look at all the things that have been picked off of the eBay and Craigslist. And so the company that I've been running for the past number of years is an online marketplace for used cars. And the whole idea being we spend a lot of time thinking through how centralized versus decentralized a marketplace do you want to build and and you get to eBay which is very decentralized and there's no there's no guarantees of anything in terms of your experience or the shipping or anything else right and so and yet building a very centralized marketplace where we're, we're doing the pricing and we're doing the customer support you know is a much harder proposition but i i think it's an interesting change in our whole economy essentially having marketplaces and peer to peer marketplaces and and I, I haven't formalized my thoughts enough to know exactly what are all the implications for society, but I think sort of changing to this peer-to-peer marketplace is... Well, here's a good example, and this is something that listeners will probably start sighing hearing me talk about, but there's been this trend of, you know, essentially securitizing, you know, or, or standardizing items. So you mentioned there's a lot of sites now where you're like, look, I want to sell my iPhone X... I can go on to Gazelle or any of these, and there's like a very specific price, which is great, you know. And then, and then vice versa if you're buying or selling something. But then there's the 95% of products that, you know, it's still a mess. Why doesn't there exist a site, you know, that's almost like a consignment clearinghouse where you're like, look, um, and I was trying to do this in my closet the other day. I was like, I have all these old clothes. I'm not going to list them on. I don't even know. So this is going to be embarrassing. Poshmark. Thread up. yeah, Thread up or whatever. And I was like, I just want to mail them all into someone. I'll give them, I don't know, half the value. Just you sell them or donate them or whatever. And for men, I know there is for thread up on for women. For men, there's nothing like that. At least I could find. But it'd be cool if there was a, and there's some areas of the world where this has happened. We had on the podcast a long time ago, Van Simmons, one of my favorites, who helped to invent the grading for baseball cards and comics. So, you know, if you're going to buy a Superman one, here's the rating. And so you know ex- exactly what you're getting. And in so many other areas of the world, it doesn't seem like anyone solved this. There was a company I saw recently that's kind of doing it called Remove based out of San Francisco. Man, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start No, this it's company. a nightmare. <laughs> I, it, being an entrepreneur is the... And the, the, the problem with the VC is you're <laughs> being like... Being an entrepreneur is a nightmare. It's a said? nightmare. It's the worst. <laughs> uh, I'm starting to get some gray hairs now, losing my hair, bags under my eyes. been doing this 10 years, but... Being a VC is kind of like being, an, I mean, people think it's an easy job in many standpoints because you hold the keys, but it's still, you're running a entrepreneurial company. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, the fun thing is that there's really five of us. That, as I said, I have two partners, but we're a small team and we're in LA. LA is big. So I'll go and I'll sit in the corner of one of our portfolio companies because our portfolio companies, some of them have, you know, 300 people and they have a couple of floors in some space. So I'll go and kind of sit in the corner and ask to like use their coffee machine from time to time because like we're as a startup, I mean, we're a startup VC fund. We're still squatting around town. So it definitely still has all that entrepreneurial hustle, which I like. So yeah, it's funny because the back in the day, 10 years ago, I used to be like, yeah, I want to start that idea. And then having been through this a few times, I'm like, no, I I just want to find someone else to do it. So if you find anyone working on anything like that, keep us in mind, because I think that's a, a problem, uh, a problem to solve. I could tell you about another you started that uh, it was a, it was a little tangent on the on the eBay side of yeah, things. But let's hear it. Um, I could tell you about other companies that yeah. are really exciting. We invested in a, a pretty early company called Probably Genetic that is, it's really a direct-to-consumer, which is not our user. It's a direct-to-consumer genetic test for targeting parents with autistic children. And the founders are these incredibly knowledgeable about bioinformatics and have a passion around rare genetic diseases. And it takes, and I'm going to forget the number, but it takes on average like seven years for someone to find out that they've actually got one of these rare genetic diseases. And yet nowadays with what we can do with genetic testing, it's possible to find that out much sooner and avoid a lot of pain and frustration. Is there enough sort of information and markers available today? And this is from someone who just doesn't know in 2020, to kind of give you insight into that information? I mean, yeah, I mean, it depends which part you're asking. So one, can you diagnose it with a genetic test? Yes. And you actually don't need a full genome sequence. You can do the exome sequencing, which is what they're doing. And two, you can start with saying, we're going to do some number of the most 
common rare genetic diseases. Two, then the other part of the question, which I think is another interesting question, which is, and then let's say you're diagnosed, does that help? Kind of like, so great, now you know you've got something. And the answer is it does. And so especially the reason they're starting with autistic children recently diagnosed is because you will spend years as a parent trying to help your child learn to speak when if you knew that the chances are one in a million that your child is going to develop proper speech, you might avoid some of the pain of going through years of that sort of therapy. So, or you might change your protocol. I'm not sure that's the best example, but there's a variety of times where you, your your treatment protocol changes. That. And, and so how does the company set up? Is it pure genetic tests? Do they then connect to providers? What's the What's the model for the company? Where are they? Yeah, so they're, so they're live. If anyone would like to check out Probably Genetic, I think it's probablygenetic.com. And it is a variety of partnerships. So they're not doing the sequencing themselves, which is increasingly becoming a commodity. And even the bioinformatics piece, the once the once the sequencing has happened, they're actually outsourcing that for now. But I think they might bring that in-house. But, you know, again, early days startup style. So it's really around helping it's almost more around helping parents navigate this because there isn't a process right now where if you went to your physician, you have the best physician, you've got some top you know, university physician, it's not easy to know how to then order a genetic, the right test and get that back. And right now, it usually still costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Whereas actually, if you have an autistic diagnosis, your insurance will likely cover it 80% of the time. So there's a variety of things. They've just made it much easier. And, and it's some about that, but it's really about the passion of these individuals where I truly believe that Lucas, who's the CEO, if he weren't doing this, he would still be doing this. Like, I don't know, that was a, something like that. Like, he has a passion around solving rare genetic diseases. Well, th- there's so much going on in that space. I mean, I- I'd studied genetics back in college, probably before my career path diverged, but it's been super interesting to see it develop. I mean, the a lot of the companies nowadays, the Ancestry and the 23andMe, and we've always, I've always wondered why, if I was a competitor to 23andMe, if I was a billionaire, I would say, why wouldn't we just do this but have the test be completely free? Because they're now like 100 bucks or something. Yeah. And then just try to build the world's largest database of medical information. Anyway, but uh, you're starting to have all this information. But it's a, sort of this critical juncture where it's still a lot of it. Some of it's useful, but some of it, it's unclear. So we, I saw a startup the other day that's doing really well. That it's targeting like the microbiome. And they sequence it and then they prescribe... Uh, some probiotics, but it, it it was weird because it it's unclear if it seems like the science is there for you get the diagnostics right, but the prescription. Well, this kind of goes to my point about you were saying it's kind of squishy. It is kind of squishy. So what I want to do is back someone who has a PhD in bioinformatics who is knows actually what is state of the art. And so it, you're right. A lot of what I what you know at the stage that we're investing in, it is still the squishy stuff. Which is this person, the person who knows exactly what is possible and is going to be able to understand the state of the industry and execute. So that's the other piece, right? Some people are great at selling. You also need to couple that with the the ability to execute. And is y'all's shop set up as one where, all right, so let's say this company or another one starts growing, does well. Do you guys then lead following rounds? Do you hand it off? Are you on the board? Are you involved? How's it work? Depends. A lot of times we're kind of agnostic about taking a board seat because one of our main goals is to help them get to their next milestones. And at some point, they've outgrown our need and also will then have other portfolio companies who are back needing our help. And so, you know, at this point, if a company, if it's coming to a a vote of the board, that is a very bad sign. Like, we shouldn't be at the point. Like, these are small companies. And I might be having weekly meetings with my companies when they're really going through, like, uh, busy, you know, product launches, that sort of thing. And so, you know, my influence should not be determined by whether or not I have a board seat at this. So it, it's not super important. What's important to me is that I have a good relationship and feel like we're actually able to add value. And yeah, the board seat, sometimes we take them, sometimes we don't. So I am on the board of Stratic. I'm not on Probably Genetic. All right, cool. I'll give you one more spot. Any more companies that uh, cross your brain? Another uh, local LA one is Health Tensor. So Health Tensor is like an AI assistant for doctors helping them pull out diagnoses and write their notes, essentially, which 
doctors find this tool, the team that's built it, really smart AI, ML engineers who've built this tool for doctors. Doctors love it. That's great. But then you get into the go to market and you say, well, you know, doctors can love it, but you're selling into hospitals. This is a huge, long sales cycle. I've seen that. I don't necessarily want to always play in that space. It's a tough space. But what they're actually doing is talking to the hospital CFO or the people in charge of looking at insurance reimbursement, and they can run historic data. So they can say, look, we're going to parse through all the doctor's notes from the past six months, year worth of data, and we're going to pull out what you could have billed but didn't bill. So a doctor might be, I might be treating you for one thing and knows you're obese, but we didn't necessarily bill out the recommendations for the full treatment there. And so they can run through and and do a much better job of classifying. And doctors love it because it makes the doctor's job much easier because doctors are spending way too much of their time sort of classifying their notes. But then it's a good go-to-market strategy to actually be able to work with the doctors, which is where their passion is. You know, it, it seems like such a messy archaic world still. I mean, um, we talk a lot about this with sports where in analytics being a quant, you know, that there's a lot of evidence in the NFL, for example, we're in the playoffs right now where the coaches just make decisions that go in direct conflict of what all of the historical odds would say. And there's some very clear biases with like going forward on fourth down, but it would be similar to me in, in a doctor setting where so much of it is not yet computer assisted, you know, there's, I mean, there's very obvious examples through history of like the radiologists and stuff where, you know, computers just much better at coming up with the diagnosis than maybe the doctor on his own is. And so it's still surprising to me that you haven't seen, and I'm sure it'll happen. And this is, sounds like kind of what uh, this company's thinking about much more of a AI, maybe it's AI assisted sort of world. And maybe it was on your show with Alex Rubalcava where he talks about radiology. And I think he makes a good example, which is, and then you think radiologists all go away because AI can do radiology bit better. But actually, the radiologists become the really intelligent value add thing. And we just have way more radiology. And all of a sudden, we're doing, we have radiology for your pet. And I think, so the interesting implications of where that's going. And, and then I think you also always have to look at the incentives. So you follow the money. And I think one of the big things that's interesting in healthcare right now is this move to value-based care, where it used to be that the CFO of the hospital or the hospital was doing the best when all the beds were full. And that was always the incentive was, you know, if, if you get shoulder surgery and then you get another shoulder sur surgery, they bill twice and there's no real downside to that. And in fact, your incentives are to have the beds full. And now we're moving to value-based care, which is where you, the incentives and the payments are around fixing the shoulder, keeping people healthy. But I think that opens up a whole lot of interesting investment opportunities too. Yeah. Well, you're seeing what One Medical is getting ready to go public, I think, here soon. It's all IPO news. I've seen a lot of like One Medical for therapists or One Medical for... Well, the therapy space, you know, I mean, given kind of where our world is, seems like a lot of opportunity there as well. And with a lot of the trends we've seen, it seems like an area that's pretty ripe for disruption being the wrong word, but advances. Yeah. So anyway, all right, before we move on to anything else, last chance, any, any, you, <laughs> we could talk about this all day. Any more, uh, any more companies that are on your brain? Anything you're excited about that you like to fund that you haven't seen? Anything, uh, any other thoughts? You know, I think it's interesting being in LA. That's a big trend um, that's been exciting is just the rise of LA. I mean, I moved here only a year ago after a couple decades in the Bay Area in, in the Sand Hill Road scene. And I think we half of our portfolio is LA based. Wow. And hopefully growing. What what are so you you guys have done what 20 30 podcasts? Uh, oh yeah. A lot of Oh my gosh, I love my I love the podcast. Yes, I do. A, you're a vet now. A lot of those LA based shops. I'm only doing so it's called LA Venture and I'm only doing LA VCs and I keep being tempted to cuz I have a lot of friends from Sand Hill Road who come down here and they say let me be on your podcast. And it's like, and I was like, should I do it if they're on like a few boards down here? And the answer is no, I'm only doing LAVCs. Do you, do you guys end up crossing over with some of these firms, co-investing? All the time. Um, all the time. All the time. So a lot of, as I said, like 700K might be a typical check, but it might be a $2 million round. So Stratic, the company I talked about, was a $3 million round, but we led it with a 750K check. So we're always trying to figure out who's the right co-investor for this company. And you mentioned before we started recording, we were talking about kind of you know, LA and the state of investing and everything else. And LA is funny because it's 
despite all of the money here, I mean, it's still in many ways a media town. And even in our world, the public investing, it's like old school. It's like bonds, you know, capital group, PIMCO, now double line, real estate, and, and still a lot of media. But you you have seen the percolation of, of venture money coming in, which is great. But you mentioned um, some ideas about accelerators. Yeah. Talk, talk to the audience a little bit about what accelerators are. Are there any in LA? I know there are a few. And what's anything going on in that world? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few interesting things. So yes, historically, you might think that LA venture investing, You might, I think five, 10 years ago, people thought of it as media, e-commerce, but LA graduates more engineers than any other city in the country. So it's not that LA Where's is that not a UCLA, USC, oh. Caltech, Harvey Mudd, UC Irvine, is that LA, you know, Southern California. There's you're a Caltech girl, right? I, you got some uh, ties. Some ties. Uh, I, I am. I am close with the Caltech crowd for sure. I did not. So I grew up across the street. I went to a high school called Polytechnic, and so um, I was across the street. So my number one criteria was not to go to Caltech. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. did not go to Caltech, but I am. I, I do have close ties there. But just just wanted to clarify that LA is it graduates a lot of engineers, and it used to be a decade ago. If you wanted to be entrepreneurial and be an engineer, you would then move up to Silicon Valley. And that's just changed. That has entirely changed. And and um, and I think that it's changed mostly because L.A. has the flywheel has started going. But it's also changed in large part because San Francisco has become more complicated, if you will. Yeah. I was going to say, like, there's these weird fractures. I mean, so I used to live in San Francisco before moving here and then Lake Tahoe. Moved here in like 05 or 06 to start Cambria. Love the city. Amazing. Uh, had in particularly Tahoe. LA also, for many different ways, I mean, they both have a great quality of life. But as you said, in, in the media in particular, a lot of commentary over San Fran last handful of years, complicated. But LA, we got the beach. I, mean, I was going to ask you about your secret surfing society. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> secret. I uh, don't right now. Right now, I've just been surfing closeouts in Venice pretty much. So it's there's no secret surfing there. I call myself like a, a wave storm surfer. Oh, yeah. Like the, for the listeners who don't surf, that's like the $200 board you can get at Costco. It's a big foam board. Um, I grew up on skis, but I uh, actually just took my two-year-old out skiing. Anyway, uh, we'll have to go surf sometime. I've been taking my like four year old, my four year old and six year old out. So wow. Oh, wow fine. Uh, you just go to right in Venice? Yeah, there's no secret. We're really yeah. like right <laughs> under the Venice Pier. Yeah, good. Well, all right. So accelerators. So accelerators, right. Sorry, you asked about the accelerators. So I think it's interesting. So on so on the podcast, I'm interviewing the, the LA VCs. And I, I did a fairly recent episode with Paul Brico at Amplify, one of the most sort of traditional accelerators. And he said, you know, we're not an accelerator anymore. We, we're now a pre-seed with benefits. That's what he called it, which <laughs> I really liked. Uh... Yeah. So, and then Laurent Grill from Luma Launch, which used to be one of the other accelerators in town. And maybe I had another, I had a third person who I thought was at an accelerator and they're like, oh no, I'm not an accelerator anymore. Mucker Labs, which used to be, and it hasn't changed as much. They're not running batches though. Very few people are running sort of a traditional accelerator has like a batch of companies. But I think what's interesting there are a variety of different things. One is that entrepreneurs, people, students are getting more educated. Everyone is getting more educated about entrepreneurship. And there's this huge wave of entrepreneurship where everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, understands what entrepreneurship is, wants to join a startup, you know, wants to change careers every few years. There's none of this, like I'm at my job, my steady job for 40 years. And so what accelerators used to offer was some of that education that is now, I think, available at every USC class, you know, has, you know, anyone who wants to be an entrepreneurship can take the entrepreneurship class and get some of those basics. And furthermore, Funds are going upstream and downstream a lot more and are much more sort of the traditionally we used to call it like the Andreessen was the first to really get into we're providing all these ancillary services. But now like a fund like mine, even though we're small, we roll up our sleeves and get quite involved And and to some degree that's some of what the accelerators used to provide. So I used to be a mentor for accelerator X, Y, Z. And I still like doing that, but essentially I'm now a mentor for my portfolio. I wonder how much, you know, so you make a couple good points, almost that, you know, there's a lot more 
templates for the basics of an entrepreneur. I mean, again, 10 years ago, if someone's like, hey, I want to start a company, you'd be like, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. I get a lawyer. Do I do? And now you can just go on to, I don't know, Y Combinator, or whoever has the forms and the classes, a lot more education. And it's funny because my opinion on this is somewhat flipped. Like maybe, I don't know if it was five, seven years ago, in my head, you just, there was a lot of this kind of money flowing into super early stage. And I was like, we spend a lot of time thinking about sentiment in public markets, which can drive them particularly to extremes. I was like, I wonder if this is just too much money flowing in. But then on the flip side, I said, you know what? It's actually, particularly with the entrepreneurs you get to meet and the ideas, it's actually like really incredible positive benefit, I think, you know, where all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, well, we now understand how this works. We can focus on just growing great companies. And you're, I think you're seeing the effects of that where a lot of these companies, whether it's Facebook, maybe not as much Snapchat here, but these companies that mint all these millionaires. Honey. Mint- <laughs> Honey is our big win. Yeah. Honey is our yeah. big $4 billion win for LA. That was recent, right? Yeah, it was just a couple months ago. End of, yeah, Q4 of, of 2019. $4 billion exit. Hadn't raised that much money and only from LA investors. Whereas Snapchat had raised from the Silicon Valley. I mean, one of the big things to get an ecosystem going is having angel investors who have some money. And so, you know, Silicon Valley benefited a huge amount when Google went public and people who were there early made money could become angels. So yeah, I hear you on money flowing into venture, but I I actually think what really dwarfs that is the number of people flowing into entrepreneurship and so you know certainly everyone says well there's you know a a lot more seed funds do we really need another seed fund i've heard that well we're inundated with entrepreneurs and they're inspiring entrepreneurs it's not i don't feel like i'm having to just sort of go beg my brother to start a company or something you know it's funny so i've been very vocal about my journey on the private side for the last five years and for a public guy you know it's funny because if you watch and you spend all day in public markets, geopolitical news, you turn into like the most depressed person on the planet. All you want to do is expect the market to crash and go down. Just And that's part of just the media and news flow in general. If you're a private market investor and you focus on early stage entrepreneurs, you're like the most optimistic person on the planet. All day long, you see these incredible, passionate people that are focusing on amazing problems. And it's almost every day, certainly every week, where I'm like, holy crap, that's an amazing idea. I never thought about that. What a cool approach great success. And all you want to do is save money and put it into these investments. Um, So it's a very odd barbell, uh, mentally at least. Um, So listeners, I encourage you to get very involved. You don't even have to invest, but at least starting to follow, you know, what some of these companies are doing. What are some good resources? So you mentioned accelerators. Who who are still the big couple? Y Combinator, Techstars? Yeah. LA, are there any more in LA, really? Big ones? Big ones. I mean, like I mentioned, Mucker or Amplify. Well, Mucker just so Mucker just hired someone from Sequoia just to be like to show what the trends yeah. are happening. Mucker would used to be like our local accelerator who just had a four billion. They incubated Honey, um, and now they just hired a partner out of Sequoia to join their team. But you know, so there's there's that aspect. But also, I think getting involved as an angel investor one it makes you a happier person. <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion, yeah. I'm biased. But, I, I 100% agree. Um, just reading the investment memos. So you don't even have to invest, but sitting, I sit on syndicates. I used to sit on more syndicates than I sit on now, but just there's a lot of, you know, I listen to the full ratchet. I'm a, I am like listening to podcasts because I live in Pasadena and none of my work is in Pasadena. So like I listen to Nick Moran on the full ratchet and, you know, he runs a syndicate that anyone can, you have to be an accredited investor, but you can join his syndicate, read his deal memos. I sit on my ex-Googler syndicate mailing list and you see these deals go through. And the great thing about syndicates as an angel investor is you can write a couple thousand dollars checks. So you actually can build a portfolio because with venture investing, we're betting for the home run and we're okay if a lot of our investments go to zero. And so you want to make sure you you don't do angel investing where you end up writing three checks for 25, 50K and then realizing that's all the, the money you have to invest. I want to talk about that. But first, it was funny because we had Tom Williams on the podcast who's done a lot of syndicates and we were talking to him and he's like, well, Meb, how many syndicates do you follow? And I said, well, all of them. And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, I sign up to follow all of them because I just like seeing all of the deal flow and reading the memos and downloading the decks and, you know, don't invest in many of them, but um, just love seeing what's going on. And I said, you can do that for free. Yeah. And listeners, I'm not going to tell you, to, you but the, it's self-accreditation. 
<laughs> you right. could sign up on AngelList and we fund Earn Republic, Seed Invest, all these other sites and at least follow along and you can do it where you don't even have to put real money to work. But eventually, yeah, a lot of them have like a thousand dollar. My biggest gripe is the companies, at least you guys are different because you're in the VC seat, but the companies that do syndicates and will have these very large, wealthy by definition, because you have to be accredited, in many cases, directly relevant investors. But I would say it's, I'm trying to think of the percentage that don't do updates. Maybe it's half that don't update or do any ask because there's so many times where we'll talk to these companies and say, hey, we're looking for this. Do you know anyone who would be a good head of sales or uh, yada, yada? And it's we also did a crowdfunding round. So from someone who's been updating it, like it's a very massive resource and it's crazy to me the ones that don't do it. Yeah. So companies, <laughs> you should do it. At least use that resource of impassioned, uh, involved investors. And not to mention one of the biggest benefits of the from a private investor side is a lot of the tax benefits. We talked about this, we're not going to get into it now, but the QSBS rules and benefits of, of investing in these companies. You can also do it in IRAs, room for another episode. What I wanted to ask you about is something I struggle with, which is, and this is true also in public markets, but it's particularly obvious in private markets because in public markets, you buy the S, uh, you buy the U.S. stock market, you get thousands of securities. You buy a venture portfolio, and you maybe have thirty names, fifty names, um, et cetera. And these power law outcomes like honey, where um, for a fund to return three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten x, you know, it's often dominated by these few massive winners. Can you talk a little bit about that? How you think about that? I'll have some follow on questions, but it's something I struggle a little bit with. Yeah, I'm not sure I can solve your struggles. But yes, you've summarized it well, which is when we're looking for these, you know, I think the typical venture investor would say they look for people, product, market as the three criteria. And market, we have to believe that there's a billion dollar outcome here or give or take, give or take a billion here, billion there. And so th we have to also believe that the entrepreneur is aligned with that and that's what they want. And so, you know, you have to at some point think about like, what are your different exits here? Not every PayPal can just, not everyone has $4 billion sitting in their back pocket. So, but I think one of the interesting things that I don't have the numbers on it on the top of my head, but seeing a lot more sort of non-traditional acquirers in a sense, which is the traditional old school industry needs and wants tech and innovation. And so there's now acquirers that are Target or Albertsons. Graycroft here, who's uh, 1.2 billion under management, a venture down the street, they have like a new uh, tracker fund with Albertsons because they're seeing interesting opportunity there. So I think just thinking about the large exit that's possible, but it also means Reed Hoffman talks a lot about blitz scaling. Like we are pushing our entrepreneurs to, there is no supply line left, like they're going for it. But that leads to back to the mental health part. I mean, that leads to, you have to be ready to sign up for that journey. And some people don't. And I, I think if I start another endeavor, you know, it's probably like a podcast. It doesn't, it's not, I'm doing, not doing this for the billion dollar exit. <laughs> well, here's, here's kind of what I'm getting at is so, you know, in the VCs have a little bit different mandate because they have investors. But if you're an individual and you, let's say you have this good problem, which is you invest in a hundred companies, how many ever go bankrupt? Some of them return your money. Some of them do two, three, five times. But let's say you start to have a few of those unicorns or or a hundred bagger investment. You know, just the the company that hit that product market fit is crushing it, whether they did any follow on rounds or not. But let's say your investment is now seeing in the multiples. But let's say it's at say a hundred x, fifty x, whatever it is. But the future looks incredibly bright. How does one start to think about? selling because it could be a situation like an Uber or many other companies that could go up 10x from there. And all of a sudden now you have a thousand bagger, which would return be make all the other 99 positions irrelevant. But also you have the very real risk that it could, this is a bad example because it's not really VC funded, but we work where all of a sudden, you know, you get to this point and then it goes down 80%. 
But there's a, there's a million examples of this. Um, is it something where people think about sewing a little along the way? Is it something where um, you have any hard and fast rules or it's case by case basis? I uh, Different thoughts on it. So one is from a... <laughs> If I'm like the employee point of view, because that's where I've sat is I saw Google go public and have a lot of people holding on to a lot of Google, right? And not knowing, I mean, it was great outcome for people to make a million dollars, but maybe you could sit on that and make a lot more or, you know, fill in the blank. And and then, you know, my friends at Twitter, my friends at Uber, all of these companies going public. And I, I tend to tell my friends when they're going public, like, figure out about how much you want to sell and sell half of that and then sell another half a little bit while. And that way... You know, every six months you're happy if in six months it goes up or down because you're just selling half. But I mean, you're more the investor on on that side of things. And then from the investor point of view, the way I think about it it is sort of a couple fold. So one is we are reserving half of our investment as in 100 percent of our investment. (laughs) Uh, We have, uh, you know, if we put a million dollars into a company, we're reserving another million that we could put back into that company as our pro rata into a next round. Um, and we like to be as data driven, not surprisingly, being sort of a data focused fund, we like to be as data driven as we can be around milestones that we want to see that would make us believe. And so, but that's having very insider knowledge, right? I mean, we are sitting on the board of a company. We know what is realistic to expect, but we like to try to be as disciplined as we can about knowing the milestones and then saying if those milestones are hit, then um, then we will reinvest and put more money back in. I think it's smart to do that ahead of time to avoid the problem of the goalpost being moved. You know, I mean, I, so many investors love to play kind of their whole portfolio and decisions just shoot from the hip. And at least establishing the benchmarks gives you an anchor from which to work with. I can't tell you how many times in the public markets people just say, you know, I'm just buy it and they're just going to play it by ear. But I, I think you give some, some good examples about way to think about it. Look, listeners, you get a 50, 100 bagger. By the way, reference, we'll put in the show note links, the old podcast we did with Chris Meyer uh, with one of my favorite books, 100 Baggers in the Public Markets. The beauty of private equity, and Cliff Asnes actually wrote a piece about this recently because for the longest time, people said private equity should return more because of an illiquidity premium. But he kind of had this thought experiment where he flipped on your head and said, look, we know how poorly people behave in public markets every single day. You can open up the Wall Street Journal, turn on CNBC and see how smart or dumb you are and quotes all day long. So part of the beauty of private markets is you can't sell something even if you wanted to. Now, at least there's now some secondaries and, and things for employees, liquidity and everything else. But it also removes that daily Mr. Market psychosis of the temptation to sell things. And for many of these hundred baggers, which this uh, book examined in public markets, it took them 10 years. You know, it's not people in their head, they think I'm going to buy something and it doubles. They're like, oh my God, amazing. I'm out. I just double my money. But in private markets and in public listeners, it's often the top five, the, the all the returns in the public stock markets determined by the 5% of the massive winners. So being a private market investor can help you get around that problem, <laughs> at least because you have no more ability to sell at all. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, any last thoughts on VC? I want to I chat about a few more topics. Uh, anything else on your brain about as we look into the future decade, any changes in VC, any thoughts on things you wish would change, be different, excited about, depressed about? <laughs> I mean, generally, obviously, I, well, maybe not obviously, I'm sort of depressed about the like state of our our country, say, on many different things. And I think innovation is the big bright spot. And I, so, you know, where I'm not a heavy public market investor, but like, I don't really want my money in this. I don't really want it in that. But, you know, as a GP, I'm putting a lot of my own personal money into my fund because I do believe that innovation in our country is the huge bright spot. I think there's lots of interesting then interplay intersection between private enterprise and government. You know, sitting at Google for many years, you saw that a lot of things that you'd like, you know, our government should decide what freedom of expression is, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. But actually, Google and Facebook are making those decisions. You know, we were talking about genetic sequencing well, you know, if you're worried about your data and Google having your data about like what websites you went to, well, it's a whole different thing when you're peeing in a toilet and the toilet knows, you know, is analyzing your pee and your shower knows your moles and your, you know, 
so so figuring all that out is going to be in private, you know, a lot of times private tech companies. And so making sure that there's good interplay between how we want the rest of our institutions to run, I think is a lot of opportunity and a lot of responsibility, I guess. Yeah, 2020 finally feels like we're living in the future now. I, yeah. I, uh, I laugh about that because some of the things you're talking about, you're starting to see come to reality. And it's wonderful to see, it's scary a little bit, like your, your former company, when, when did you join Google? O2. You have kind of like the hits background. I love to talk about this for a little bit. We, we got Stanford, Harvard, Google, Shift, which we'll talk about. I was in San Francisco, same time. So I had a lot of early Google friends. There's not too many Mebins in the world, but that's why I had the, the original Mebin at Gmail because I, I had some, some Google friends pass me along that email address. I used to crash the Google parties in Tahoe before they went public. Yeah. So you, were, you used to use, probably attended some of those. I did the Google and Burning Man. Yeah, same thing, <laughs> same thing. It, I, I used to joke. I said, man, this company must be making so much money. So much they, money. Uh, through the best parties. So at Google, what, what, uh, what were you doing at Google? Well, I mean, as I was saying earlier, like a lot of what we were all doing was hiring because I joined when it was 500 people. I left when it was 60,000 people. My Lord. Yeah. So it was, we doubled in size every six months or something for a long time when I was there. And, and so wait, so what was the order? It was Google, then business school no business school and google so okay. uh yes like what did you say the hits yeah <laughs> my mom I was always halfway says I... expecting you to show up with a san fran puffy vest or yeah fleece vest. yeah no um <laughs> no my my mom says i look good on paper <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> once you get to know me you know? yeah so you know i'm from southern california i went to stanford i'm kind of a flip-flop wearing person i like to surf the beach break you know and then i went to business school and i'm not really a you know i'm not really a spreadsheet i mean whatever i studied math computer science like i can handle a spreadsheet but like wasn't of interest really so I when I graduated I had no job all my friends had jobs like months in advance and I really didn't like I did not know what I wanted to do so I went well, this was 02 02 yeah yeah well that was that was like the internet Armageddon so I graduated college in 2000 all my buddies had started moving out there in the late 90s of San Francisco and they're like Matt you Gotta get out. There's jobs everywhere. Right, right. <laughs> so they're like, this is the best time. It was the best bubble ever. I yeah. loved it. Yeah. But I caught the end of it. So I I was there like in the aftermath. Well, the first company I was at, Live Person, we IPO'd in March of 2000. Huh. So this is why I went to business school. Yeah, yeah. And it's still around, still a public company. But at the time, not a profitable public company. And so it was going to have a lot of layoffs. So anyways, that was 2000. Live Person? Live Person. It's um like chat for e-commerce. Um, and, and at the time, it was this notion that people were scared to put their credit cards in. This is 90, 99, maybe, or so. And so people were scared to put their, you know, abandoned shopping carts. Still a thing. When you see, like, the pop-up, um, live person powered a lot of that, which made a ton of sense to me in, you know, it still makes sense, actually. Anyway, so we IPO'd then. Um, but the point was that the startups weren't recruiting out of business school. No one wanted an MBA. I don't, like, highlight. Still, I don't, like, highlight that I have an MBA but yeah, so I, I joined Google and like the first thing we all needed to do was just hire more people because there was so much money that, you know, Omid used to stand on a literal sandbag and be like, you know, I'm going to discuss the numbers, but you can't discuss this outside of Google because we're doing so well. We don't we want people to know, but we couldn't go public. So the first thing I worked on was actually our ability to go public. So I worked on our billing system, which is at the time we were still already multiple billions of dollars in revenue, but in 20 cent increments. And so we had to close the books every month. We needed Oracle to produce an invoice. But we were collecting logs from a server that's based in Hong Kong for Chinese internet searcher with a Japanese advertiser. And, you know, the server would go down and all the logs wouldn't be available. And yet we needed to close the books. So basically, you're the one responsible for that guy who just sent 100 million in Google invoices. In accident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th that? That. Listeners, there was there was some guy, this is a couple of years ago, I think, wasn't it, uh, who had, had sent. Oh, it was like a hundred million to Facebook and Google and someone else and just invoices that got paid and he's in jail somewhere now, but it was like a whole operation anyway. Well, but there was a lot of that to sort out, which was, um, 
I hope Google doesn't mind me saying this, but to some degree, if we didn't know, well, this is a pretty public company, but like if we didn't know how much an advertiser owed us, we just wouldn't bill them because we didn't know. And so we just figured they won't complain if we underbill always because we just like the billing system was hard. And there was a lot of, you know, I mean, it's way more complicated now, but a lot of people who wanted only clicks on the weekdays, but on the weekends. And, you know, you had to make sure everything was coordinating all you're doing. So. I mean, look, it happens at, at smaller companies too. I, I personally have known four companies, either friends or um, that we've known that have had five actually money embezzled, non-trivial amount of money where like employees are just writing checks or whatever happening. A recent one was four million bucks, but just because it's you know there's money slot moving around, yeah, you know it's still have. I don't know how you get away with it in 2020, but people think you do. Yeah. All right, so then Google, then then you had the uh, what was the inspiration to um, start Shift? Well, so I'd been at Google a long time there, and I said things like I'm being really entrepreneurial, like Google starting a lot of things. I had a lot of latitude. I was working with Chris Saka very closely. We shared an office for many years at Google starting projects. And I was like, I'm being entrepreneurial. That's why I'm staying. I'd been here, you know, almost a third, a third of my life when I left. And then I went on maternity leave, actually. And one of my friends, I angel invested in a shift when it was just a PowerPoint. I mean, pre seed, it was just a friend of mine. So my angel invested and then I went on maternity leave and he said, you know, maybe you could help me get it going. And then I really became an entrepreneur and realized how ridiculous it is to say you're being entrepreneurial when someone, you know, serves you quail lunch every day. And so then I went, that sort of began my entrepreneurial journey. And I think for me, the biggest hook was probably just that speed of entrepreneurship and being at a startup really suits me. Like I really like the, we're not all buttoned up and we're not like, I don't know what I'm saying until it comes out of my mouth. And we were moving at a million miles an hour and building something that people really liked and were thanking us for building it. And so I just got hooked on that. I was waking up, going to sleep, thinking about my startup and it was exciting. Chaos is a better way to describe it. Hopefully control chaos. And so you were also involved in a number of fundraising rounds too. Oh yeah. What was what was that experience like? Oh yeah, it was just like we spent five years on Sand Hill Road, kind of. Um, so we did a three million seed, a twenty million Series A, a fifty million Series B, a thirty. I don't know. We raised like two hundred million. Any uh, any fun stories from that time? <laughs> you know, it's just like looking back on it. I just it's remarkable how little I knew because now all the entrepreneurs I see are way better informed, and I don't know how I managed to miss all this. But like our rule of thumb there was, we didn't know who was the right investors, and we weren't as smart about it as uh, the investor as the entrepreneurs I see nowadays. But we just say, okay, take the fund size, divide by fifty. Ask them for that much money, multiply by five, and that's what we think our valuation should be. But like the, we had the, yeah, really like clever. But we that was like kind of our rule of thumb. Uh, lessons learned on mostly around like we got two great board members. We had DFJ and Highland Capital invest in our. They split our Series A. We ended up with two great board members, and um, I really learned how to. The the chaos that you talked about, the pants on fire, I'm an operational person. Like, I'll go, 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 go. And I really learned how to schedule my board meetings for three months in advance to talk about something strategic that we needed to discuss or else we would never – it would be so busy just like we were selling cars and we had pigeons that were shitting on the cars and I needed to figure out how to like, you know – it was that sort of stuff. If I didn't schedule the strategic discussion, I wouldn't necessarily like have the time. So, you know, just – Figuring out uh, your board members are so important, and so raising money was important, but um, intimidating for me. It was very intimidating to march into Sequoia and say, like, you should write me a check for $20 million. Well, they gave it to you. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, exactly. But I think, and, you know, so figuring out how to navigate all that, I guess. And so there was also a pit stop at Code for America, right? Yeah. What was, what was the kind of impetus for that? Yeah, I still would really feel like I should be doing more in um, in all facets of life. <laughs> Let me just finish that sentence. I feel like I'm like should be doing more all across the board. But Code for America is about bringing tech and government together and looking at how government and tech can really learn from each other. It's not like a let's be the tech people who come and tell government what to do, but a lot of our experience of government is in digital services nowadays. So the digital interfaces and so helping government kind of get into the 21st century around at Code for America, we had three areas of focus, food, jobs, and justice. But like if you're applying for food stamps in California, there is an application that takes 45 minutes, doesn't save state, and doesn't work on mobile. 
So you want to apply for food stamps. The answer is, I'm sorry, you can't use your phone to do that. Oh, it doesn't save state. So if you get partway through, you're going to have to start back at the beginning. And so you wonder why people are frustrated with government is because they're used to having everything on demand. And like I live next to a woman who lives on the street, a homeless person who orders her Amazon to a fake address, but the Amazon delivery person knows to deliver it to her tent. But like you can't, you apply for food stamps. It doesn't work on your phone. So we need to find a way of better serving people. So anyways, as I was saying, some bright spots about our country, some less bright spots. Well, it's, it goes back to that old kind of on the entrepreneur ideas of, of frustration arbitrage, finding the areas that are just like total garbage. And government obviously is notorious for this. I mean, my God, I went to go get the new California, got to get these real IDs. And even with an appointment, I have, did you, too. have you done it yet? Yeah, it was. I went like five times. <laughs> I, it it took me like two hours. I had to go to like five different stations within the DMV, and it literally could have taken I five minutes, but just the most god awful experience on the on the planet. And yet, you know, uh, there's amazing when you get to work with government. The amazing people working in government, and yet there's not a lot of. There's a lot of fluidity between my friends who worked at Airbnb and worked at Dropbox and worked at Google. And so if there's a best practice around like designing a mobile app, like you better believe that everyone's doing stand up daily check ins the same way if there's some best practice it's carried. But there isn't that you, there isn't a fluidity where you're working at a city manager for Pasadena and now you're the city manager for El Segundo. Like there isn't or, you know, you're at Airbnb one day and then I turn around, and look you up the next day. And, oh, you've moved over to the city manager's office like and so figuring out how to make that actually work, I think is crucial because you don't want Google making your decisions about how your data is used. You want you want some, you know, you want government, you want some intelligent entity. <laughs> so, yeah, so I did that for a little while. And then what was the impetus for finally deciding to join 10110? Well, so for me, it was moving to L.A. because L.A. is awesome. So yeah, well, like, that's a, that's, a, that's <laughs> you know, it's funny, L.A., I, I moved here to try it for a year and fully expected to hate it. Being a mountain guy for a long time, I'm like, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to give the beach a year. And then I was like, wait a minute, this is kind of the land of milk and honey. Yeah. I love it. It's really nice. It sucks you in. And that was 12 years ago. Well, I get friends ask me a lot, like, what should I join this company? Should I join that company? Should I do this startup? And I always say like, and people say like, some people say like, join a startup where the person is a person you want to become the CEO. And I'm like, no, no, join a startup that's printing cash and growing like a rocket ship. And like, there will be a land of opportunity. And I feel like LA is going now from, I've always been in tech. So like, I, you know, I didn't want to be in Hollywood, but it really feels like, like a growing startup, which is exciting to be a part of. It's like the movie business but with much better odds you know yeah. oh <laughs> so much like, oh yeah i mean being a woman in computer science is a good it, it's a nice place to be right now and by the way talk to me a little bit about that i mean and also i'd love to hear a little bit about how you seem to manage <laughs> manage so much i have one child and it's fucking exhausting yeah um you've you've done that thrice over i believe three you said, yeah. um and also seem to manage a, a career talk to me a little bit about your experience over the years well, I mean, it's all mixed. It depends what day you ask me is really the true answer. But yeah, so we did manage to have three kids under the age of four. And then like it was pretty clear we weren't having a fourth because that was I, I sort of like pushing myself as hard as I can until I hit a breaking point. And like with three kids under four, like we hit our breaking point. But to some degree, I've read Lean In. I participate in all the female mentorship groups it really does feel like women, like the tenor of being a woman in business, a woman in tech has really changed the past three, four years or something. It's it's changed dramatically in terms of how many people are actively noticing that you're a woman, reaching out hands to help. Like I get offers to sit on boards, be on panels, whatever, because they're actively trying to have more diversity of thought and gender and everything else. So um, so that's been exciting. I also have a stay-at-home husband. So I just like I have to <laughs> like qualify everything, which is my husband does all the work, which is fantastic. And by Monday, I am like, whoo, I get to go to work. I am so stoked to be at work today because I'm Wait, exhausted. Do you see why I have a couch in my office? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this stupid standing desk thing. I just want a lying down desk. <laughs> like the old Mad Men days. Like I, you know, except the martini part, I... Do my best work horizontal, probably. But my startup journey of shift, and like you said, like everything looks good from the outside, but like it's total roller coaster, like 
shit show is what I was going to say, like up and to the right, like upside down at times. And like it was useful for me to have something I cared about more than I cared about work. And because I would have been just 110 percent, whatever, 100 percent all about work all the time. And that's all I would have done. And to have kids who are going to drown themselves in the bathtub, you're like, oh, got to pay attention. That's why I like surfing, too, because you might drown. And so you don't worry about your PowerPoint not being done or something. Well, you can come down to Manhattan Beach. We have the finest closeouts of anywhere around. Yeah, awesome. I, was act- I was actually up in, um, drove up to Santa Barbara uh, this past weekend. And it's funny because you have these beautiful point breaks, but there's 100 people on right. them like Rincon or Malibu. So I um, need to get out at, at five. We got a couple of other folks in the office that are in the same category of, of surfing. So you organize a trip. Let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll come join you in Venice. As you look forward to the future, the next decade, you can answer this in a few different ways as you see fit. Anything you're particularly excited about, whether it's in venture, whether it's personal, any fun goals, the new year just rolled around. So any resolutions, mainly I'm fishing because I need one. I don't have one yet this year. Listeners, send me a good resolution if you have one for me. Yeah, mine... And by the way, listeners, do not send me just talk less because I know there's going to be five of you a-holes that are going to say, Meb, stop talking so much <laughs> on the podcast. Uh, that oh one's already gosh. there. That's uh, why I love going on your podcast. I get to talk a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have the same problem. My host, I like to, I just want to talk. Yeah. Um, I know I haven't fully formulated my, my goal, but something about being optimistic. No, I just want to keep doing a lot of what I'm doing right now. Like, I love it. I'm, I'm so in my honeymoon phase of loving what I'm doing. Um, I, I want to keep listening to what entrepreneurs needed, needs are, but I still see so many great entrepreneurs that I, I would fund 100 times the number of entrepreneurs if I could. Um, but, you know, obviously you have to be disciplined and, and make the big bets. But no, I just keep doing what I'm doing. Well, that's when, um, you know, I, I think it's spot on. I mean, one of the reasons um, that the angel list and all these other angel networks that I think is so interesting is that even – if you wanted to put in a small amount, like say $1,000 just to follow along so that if, by the way, they then end up doing a series A or whatever, you can participate in the further rounds is an interesting way to think about it. In the public markets, we used to call this like Warren Buffett or someone would buy one share just so they'd get the annual report. So they just, they keep current. Otherwise you forget about it and it disappears. But like you mentioned, it's so, uh, such a, reviving experience to get to see all these uh, wonderful entrepreneurs. And from someone who's been on both sides, it's way easier doing what we do mm. oh, yeah. <laughs> than, than being in the entrepreneur side. Uh, you can also be a mentor. So the other thing, like I did text too much mentor. Work. Oh. Too much work. Too much work. You can be the mentor. But there's a but there's an aspect of you can see then, like, so I did Techstars mentor program where I do female founder office hours. You can be a mentor and see uh, I think they have 12 companies in their in their batch and you get to see 12 companies pretty quickly. You don't have to like dig in and be like a permanent, you know, mentor. So different ways of getting involved. What's been your most memorable investment? Oh, I mean, probably Google is, you know, the <laughs> Google. Uh, are you still a shareholder or are you cleaned house? I'm still a shareholder, wow. but like my best investment was joining Google in 02. And my worst was selling and, you know, selling as much as I sold in like whatever, 05 or something. Well, that's that's the hard part. It's the old Bitcoin pizza thing, you know, and you can apply that to almost any stock you own. And in the public markets, there was a book a couple of decades ago where guys talking about the coffee can portfolio, meaning you buy something, you put it in there and then just forget about it forever. Now, most people have a hard time doing that because life intervenes and often you have one stock that ends up becoming 25, 50, 70, 80, 90 percent of your portfolio. And that's um, for other reasons, probably unrealistic. But there's so many examples throughout history where it may have been a janitor or plumber that saved over the years and just put money in the stocks and then just never touched them again. I think you mentioned DFJ and one of the guys from there I had heard on a podcast who says his goal is to never sell, which again would be nice if you have that position, but in the real world is a little is a little harder to do. But giving it time to compound forever. But you always end up having one way or the other, uh, which I loved your advice uh, about going halvesies. Yeah. Because uh, then you, either way. <laughs> you you eliminate that hindsight regret and, because that's the the hardest thing. Yeah. Is looking back and saying, man, I wish I had done X, Y, Z. Talk to me a little bit uh, as we wind this down. What are some resources? You know, you mentioned accelerators, obviously your podcast, Listeners, check out. It's wonderful. We'll add it to the show notes. Anything else, either from a founder or early stage investor 
that comes to mind that you think is particularly helpful? Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly a podcast listener. So, you know, I'll, I'll subscribe to the Strictly VC newsletters and things. But, you know, I listen to 20 Minute VC, Full Ratchet, Tech News Ride Home, Pivot. Oh, my God, Kara Swisher. I love. She's great. She, I you love know, her. In, you know, the funny thing about so Kara pissy. Swisher, years ago, I, I used to just in my head, I was like, she seems so grumpy all the time. But I love her podcast. Yeah. I've been listening well, to Well, Pivot is now. way, I think Pivot is a step up. Pivot is her with Scott Galloway. Yeah. I think it's a step up from even just Kara on her own because he's such a pissy yeah. big dog, yeah. big dog. Yeah. <laughs> Since you're the VC, I can I can request this for, I, can you explain? So I, I'd subscribe to 75 podcasts. Hmm. We have hired someone and pay him a not insubstantial amount of money. Shout out Colby. And he curates those podcasts and and sends us the top say five each week which i think by the way is a fantastic use of resources but all of this comes from the fact that not a single podcast app allows for ratings and you've probably heard me drone on about this and it drives me absolutely nuts that if i was a podcast app in i don't know four through 20 that are all undifferentiated why not add episode ratings and build a database to where they all think the discovery is about other shows, when in reality, at this point in 2020, most people have their shows, but not all the shows are good. So if you find one, let me know. I will invest, because it drives me absolutely So it's not show ratings, it's episode ratings. Episode based. Dude, I could rate my own episodes and tell you which ones to listen to. So right, so you've done, done, say, 30. We've done probably around 200. And again, like sometimes it's not necessarily the fault of the host or the guest. Sometimes you just haven't had a Snickers in a while or just whatever. The vibe just isn't great. It's not a great show. Sometimes you're expecting it to be a terrible. And then sometimes I think it's a terrible show and the guests are like, it's amazing. Yeah. And vice versa. Um, But Almost universally, similar to Rotten Tomatoes, if it's rated a 98, it's probably good. If it's rated a 10, it's probably terrible. But we don't have that. Yeah. Well, also, could Colby do that and just make it make a new podcast that is the Colby's curated podcast? And I'll subscribe to that. It's possible. Maybe I'm not interested in the same thing. So but what we do is we just send out a once a week. Yeah, I know. But so that's the thing is like, I think there's a big trend left for human curation you know, we've been doing it with the Idea Farm for six, seven years now, and it's been a successful business, but very niche to what we do. You're seeing it some with other areas where it's it's being successful, and maybe AI will help out here, but still it's this curation that just isn't, there's areas where it's just not effective. And so in the podcast, the problem as a business model is that Apple wakes up tonight, turns this feature on, and then, you know, it's done. But the point is, I, I just, it, I, and believe me, I harass these poor podcast founders all the time about it. Anyway, so listeners, if you guys find one, let me know. The breaker is the best so far. It at least lets you like them. Yeah. And the signal is extremely high. You can go sort Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan or Kara Swisher by the most liked. And universally, they're great episodes. Now, you just turning this into an a hour-long Meb rant. <laughs> There's going to be so much innovation in the audio space. Uh, audio as an interface, whether it's for podcasts or, you know, how we interact with all the content we consume. Yeah, and, and, and voice, too. Um, you know, as far as the at live, I was watching as everyone massively complains about, like, the announcers during a sports game. It'd be wonderful just to turn them off and turn on someone else. Yep. Anyway, so all right, so resources podcast. Do you do you attend any of the um, like demo days or anything anymore? Yeah, I mean the the best resources for me have been that I'm actually just good at asking for help about stuff, and and I and I encourage everyone. I see entrepreneurs all day long, and it's interesting how I could tell you I could sort them in terms of whether I gave them in, good feedback based on their like openness to it. There are people who like don't like. It's very hard to pass. Mostly what I do is meet with entrepreneurs and don't fund them, right? Like that is 99% of what I do. And so having them actually get useful feedback from the people they're interacting with is probably what I, I think a lot of people are already out there in those mixes, but they're not 
taking as good advantage of them as they could. But yeah, I go to the demo day type stuff, but I go sort of to see all the my other co-investors yeah, um, as it's, much. I mean, sometimes I sure. sometimes I, I'll go ahead of time um, and meet all the portfolio companies and visit them before demo day usually. All right. Well, where do people find more? What you're up to? What's all the best spots? You know, LA Venture Podcast. And then like, I'll respond to emails all day long, like mini at 1010.net. I... It is .net. I don't, you know, I'm an inbox 10,000. I don't stress if I don't reply to everyone, but like send them my way. That's my nightmare. I'm a zero. I'm a zero oh, guy. Get I over it. I can't help it. Get over I it. I can't help it. Um, Minnie, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Listeners, we'll add all these to the show notes, mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. You can subscribe to the show anywhere it's found. My favorite currently is Breaker. Leave us a review. We love to read them, I promise. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Mm-hmm.